Hello, everyone. Welcome and happy Friday. If you're in New York, I hope you're staying dry. It's so rainy out today, but thank you so much for joining us and tuning in. Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 909th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a programs associate here at the Rail, and today I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC for a conversation featuring Charlotte Kent, Ethan Bond Watts, Saul Ostro, and William Corwin. We are also thrilled to welcome poet George Fragopoulos here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter, and here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guests and hosts. Associate Professor of Visual Culture at Montclair State University, Dr. Charlotte Kent, has a particular interest in historical frameworks for art practices with a research focus on contemporary digital culture and the absurd. She writes for assorted magazines and academic journals, and we are lucky to have her as an editor at large here at the Brooklyn Rail. Ethan Bond Watts is an artist living and working in New York and Vermont. His practice spans collaborative performance, living sculpture, institutional commissions, and vibrant installations. Independent curator and critic and co-founder of Critical Practices Incorporated, Saul Ostro has organized over 80 exhibitions and his writings have appeared in art magazines, journals, and catalogs in the USA and Europe. He served as art editor for Bomb, was co-editor of Lusitania Press, and editor of the book series Critical Voices in Art, Theory, and Culture. And our host today is sculptor and journalist Will Corwin, who's from New York. Will has exhibited at galleries in New York, London, Hamburg, Beijing, and Taipei. He contributes regularly to the Brooklyn Rail and other publications. And he is the editor of Formalism, Collected Essays of Saul Ostro. Um, thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Will. Well, welcome, everyone. I hope everyone is uh, safe and dry in this uh, flash flood warning New York. Um, we are here to talk about and celebrate the work of Bobby Ansbach, um, an artist who uh, born in 1987, died tragically in 2022. Um, and he ha currently has an exhibition now, which was sort of, which was put together by um, the family of Bobby Ansbach and Saul Ostrow and David Goodman and several other, Sarah Griffin and several other uh, hardworking individuals. Um, the exhibition is comprised of a series of machines which are uh, sort of all titled A Place for Continuous Eye Contact. They are immersive structures which, um, <clears throat> in which individuals or pairs of individuals uh, are enveloped by a kind of a hallucinogenic or, or a sort of false hallucinogenic experience, which then triggers sort of a real one. Um, I think the first thing to talk about on Spock's you know, practice and his creativity is to talk about the machines since that is what we have. Um, and I guess I would open that up to Saul and Ethan Bon Watts, who was um, on Spock sort of long-term uh, assistant and co-creator. And just to say, can we get a, can we have a definition of what the machines are, what they do? The, for at least the way I describe them is that portable, uh, immersive environments they're sort of like vr without without a headset hmm. uh, ethan um thanks william yes they are sculptures they're machines that the viewer enters and has an experience of light and sound and physical experience that lasts usually around five minutes, sometimes longer during private visits. And uh, they can be very transformative. They're 
I think of them as sensory deprivation chambers through sensory overload. Um, to talk a bit about, Ethan, if you can talk about how these machines were developed, how they were conceptualized and created, uh, you had sort of firsthand experience. What was what was your, what was obviously Bobby Ansbach's process and how did you work with him? How did you contribute? What did, what did he do to create these? Sure. So all of the machines as they exist now, Bobby thought of as prototypes and they're prototypes on the way toward the invention of the perfect machine and what he described as the most beautiful thing in the world. So he started with pure concept. He was fascinated by social interaction um, between two people. And the first iteration of these machines included no machine at all. It was a set of instructions that um, brought two friends to an um, unfamiliar place in the city. They would both put on hoodies and listen to a Vivaldi recomposed by Max Richter while maintaining eye contact with each other for the duration of the song. Bobby loved um, the magic that happens during continuous eye contact between two people. And he was also fascinated by the perceptual neuroscience that went into how we create environments, a sense of place, a sense of space, and a sense of interaction. And so by maintaining eye contact with another person for at minimum three and a half minutes, all kinds of interesting things start happening visually that it's sort of like when you had an optical illusion book as a kid and you stare at one dot until the dot next to it disappears as your blind spot enters or focusing on any visual point and the room kind of melts away. So before the machine, he was exploring these phenomena. Now the three and a half minutes, just to interrupt, is that, was that based on, on Bobby's experiments or was that based on research? How did he come up with that? Or how did he you... pulled it from, yeah, he pulled it from literature and I don't know where he found it, but he took a class while he was at the Rhode Island School of Design in perceptual neuroscience. And that's, that's where he kind of got on this track. Hmm. And so then he started exploring the physical and optical phenomena that take a person out of place in time or thought of it the opposite way. What tools does our mind and body have to place ourselves in place in place and time? And so he started layering all of these uh, optical illusions in ways of sort of disassociating where you are and where your body position is. So he started incorporating an eye patch to remove binocular vision. He immobilized the head of the viewer by having the viewer lie down, which removes um, parallax, which is another tool that we use to uh, see space, um, to see depth. And then he used camouflage technology by having no hard lines. You can see with these pom-poms that um, he has layers of machine that are closer or further away, but they all have these kind of broken edges with pom-poms, soft broken edges in colors. And the pom-poms are different sizes depending on how close they are to the iris of the viewer. Mm. And that extremely precise location and size uh, makes the sense of depth disappear and the entire machine kind of mush into this serene placeless place, kind of a utopia. So then through this, the prototyping process where he's kept incorporating new tools, layering them on top of each other to offer the viewer an increasingly disassociative experience, he was trying to create for the viewer, and I think quite effectively, an experience similar to that of deep meditation which was very important to him personally and spiritually, Buddhist meditation. So with the current generation of, again, what he thought of as prototypes, 
there is just a lot going on with materials, with optical and physical phenomena. Um, he commissioned an original musical score by an ambient and kind of new age music producer who he loved named Matthew Cooper, who goes by Alluvium. And that original score was a collaboration where Bobby and Alluvium worked very closely together for months, honing this musical score so that it would enhance the experience. And, you know, like a movie, the music is half the picture. So now, Charlotte, you experienced Bobby Anspach's work first in 2022 at the uh, at the Spring Break Art Fair. Um, what was, why did it jump out at you? What was your initial reaction? You wrote about it. Obviously, it it, it had an impact. What what was what was your initial feelings? And then how did that develop? Yeah, I mean, it was um, it's such a pleasure to be here. In part because it's such an interesting. Um, it was such an, uh, a moment, uh, those art fairs in 2020, and to be seeing this, uh, to, I experienced the work. Um, I walked by it a few times before I sort of decided I was going to venture in, um, which I think is an experience that other people have. They're incredibly friendly machines, but they're still also machines. And um, they're not trying to detract from that. Like even, I think this is a great photo to have up for the moment, like the wires are visible. The whole sort of setup is there and present and it's not hiding any of that. And I think there's a way in which um, our modern relationship with machines is ones that are very slick and sleek and really hide how they what they're doing how they're doing it um there isn't that sense of you know even with early video games you would sort of attach the wires in the back with this you know with a with a clamp and with a screwdriver and so you set it up there's a sense that you could actually mess with things um and we don't really have that anymore and so to see it is both kind of um, a relief, but also so weird, um, it's discomforting. And I think it takes a moment to kind of just not be scared of that and to re like to feel okay about it. And then there's the rest of the sort of um, production of it, which is, you know, with, with the soft balls and the lots of colors and the blankets um, that does its own sort of, uh, what, what I sort of sometimes describe as like this in and out thing. It's like, I, I, I want to approach and I want to stay away. Um, as one sort of figures out what that kind of, uh, that soft touch, that, that space of, um, basically calling for engagement, for interaction, which is itself, um, it's a, it's a tricky thing to do as anyone who is involved in interactive arts performance is well familiar with. Um, so eventually I, I, I did get into it and I was. Literally into it, by the way. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to, you have to lie down and the thing and the, the sort of dome came down and I just sort of, and it was. A very intimate experience and I've often asked myself actually um, if part of that had to do with the fact that um, uh, only a week later a uh, pandemic would shut everything down and I was very very aware of it at the university we were already talking about you know maybe having to plan for this um, I had been going around the art fairs with a mask and um, sanitizer and most people weren't yet and so I was also having this kind of um, interesting experience in terms of being in a touching context with something. Uh, but it was safe, like there, there was sanitizer, there were all these things. And I think part of it was the experience of it. Someone has to be there to also, um, it, it's not something you can totally experience alone. Like it, there, there's someone there, there's someone who's turning it on. And I think that also produced a sort of different type of experience um, and one that I'm still honestly thinking through. Anyway, long story. Um, I really enjoyed it and it sort of st stuck out at me. And it was one of the reasons um, I, I did. I wanted to sort of writing about it in a short write up about the fairs and the way people were dealing with interactive art at the time. Um, 
I, if I can just jump in, well, I know you have a million questions, but can I ask, if I may ask a question as well, um, I'm really curious about how Bobby selected the materials, the fabrics. Um, I mean, was it, was it based on their haptics? Was it based on, and they're all very designy. They have patterns on them. They have like animals on them. How was he picking? Uh, should I feel that, Saul? I think, I think Ethan, yeah, that's... Okay, very good, yeah. He chose these materials, the fabrics and all the materials based on their function and also based on pulling from a wide variety of cultural and personal influences. Mm. So there was memory of childhood involved, identity, the power that he felt when he wrapped himself in a tiger towel as a kid, the power of the tiger. And then um, for the tigers in particular, that, that's also a quiet reference uh, to his mom. That was kind of a nickname that his mom's father called her. And then um, we're looking at the tent right now. That's a fabulous jacquard fabric that is based on a 16th century um, tent that was used to broker peace between the kings of England and France. So it has this kind of wild um, reference to European conflicts and uh, conflict resolution, and also um, the texture of it. It uses, uh, what do they call it, Dutch metal, um, brass, that's kind of fake gold. So it's inspired by this golden fabric, this luxury fabric. So um, opulence and peace. And then uh, craft materials, what you could get at Harbor Freight or uh, the craft store or what you might find in the craft cabinets at even a preschool or something like that. So it, it was materials high and low based on what was in reach, what he thought was beautiful, and really just intuitively what was right for that particular solution on that particular piece. And when you add it all up, uh, it just makes for this very rich text that brings the viewer across their own memory, sense of art and architecture history. Um, and it's very tactile, it makes you wanna to touch them, except for all those exposed wires. So mm -hmm. again, that push and pull that you were touching on, um, I completely agree with you that resonates with me, that these pieces at once draw you in and repel you um, there's a sense of danger, but also comfort. And um, the hosting is a really big part of that too, that you do have a, a caretaker who is bringing you on this journey for every viewer who sees the piece. They're, they're, all of these pieces are intended to be experienced with a guide guiding you through them. And was that out of practicality or is that was that a sort of a, a, a theoretical philosophical idea of, of always being paired with another person? I think both. The It would be hard to have the, a viewer based on their reading of vinyl text on the wall, mm. follow the instructions closely enough so that they have this very refined curated experience. Also, Bobby was a fabulous host he had real magic with his own continuous eye contact. And people who knew him um, are often struck by how intense and persistent his eye contact was. And so the, I think, again, the how unnerving that can be, but also welcoming if the intentions are warm and welcoming. Um, the tension that exists there is part of the experience for the viewer that makes them feel like this is intense and it's unusual and I want to be part of it. This guy's really being real with me, both with exposing how the machines are made and with his eye contact and his insistence that this is a transformative experience that can offer me a unique experience and one that can transform me in the, to push the mission forward of saving the world. Mm -hmm. 
Can we can we queue up a video of the experience? I wanted to ask Saul a question, which was that in your there's a by the way, there's a wonderful catalog that goes with the exhibition that's currently up. Um in your in your essay, you talk about contextualizing Bobby Ansbach's work within the um the movement of the symbolists and the decadent in uh in Paris in, in the 19th century. Um can you what what are the what are the artists you're thinking of that relate to this kind of uh mystical or or uh out of body kind of experience that you were thinking of? Saul, so unmute. Uh, it's much more the notion of the bohemian experience, the notion of, uh, the carnivalesque, the, the, those aspects of theatricality and, and perform, perform it, performance that I'm thinking of in terms of the symbolist and the decadent, uh, the decadent were obviously, uh, these artists, sort of pre, pre Dadaist artists who, wanted to expose art as uh, an elitist, as somewhat elitist and so on and so forth, and therefore played with art as, as a sort of joke, on some, some case a joke. And on the other hand, something that was incredibly veiled. And, you know, in terms of talking about Bobby's aesthetic, it's a very carnival aesthetic. It's a very high low aesthetic. It's it it's a it's a mashup of differing source materials, and you know that's not necessarily available to the viewer, other than through through the through the the experience of it. One doesn't understand doesn't necessarily know why there's a tiger on the on the on the blanket that uh, accompanies this machine and things like that. But it's the idea that even before you're in the machine, that they're somewhat overwhelming. And then you also, I mean, I, we can also open this up to Charlotte uh, and the art historians in the room, as it were. But um, then it, then you kind of say, well, this is also contextual, contextualized within the kinetic art movement, uh, first sort of codified by Naam Gabo. Um, what what is kinetic about i mean you know looking at them it's something you enter into i always perceive the, the, you know the, the the history the history of the type of work that i i associate this with actually goes back long before uh gabo and the holy mahalan naj goes back to stanton mcdonald right and the people who in the turn of the century were making light organs and wanting to uh create a sound light and make create the, the sound version of music and wanted this immersive ex wanted this immersive experience that electricity allowed and the electric light allowed for and they wanted to project colors and they wanted to create spaces in which color was projected and surrounded you so and you know the whole it, the whole there's a whole history uh, at least a hundred year history or more of people making machines people wanting uh sound light and motion uh that to extend the, the work of art into the realm of sound light and motion rather than traditional media and that's that's where i locate these uh a lot of that history ended up not being part of the modernist art history uh, and ended up being embedded into the history of state, theater, film, animation, things like that. Though, it, though quite seriously, it seems to originate with this desire to produce an immersive environment, uh, art, an immersive art. Hmm. But I mean, immersive art is well. Charlotte, do you do you want to comment on what what is your take on it as kinetic kinetic work? Yeah, I mean, I I I'll be honest and say like I had not initially thought of it as kinetic, which is not to say it's not there. I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting 
um, about good work is the way in which one can have different, you know, sort of lines of thought through it, right? Um, I think it's one of those um, unfortunate things sometimes when an artwork suddenly becomes positioned and like this is its lineage and it only has this one through line, um, which isn't to say, I mean, so for me, the kinetic in particular hadn't come up. Um, I mean, I, I, I did, certainly couldn't help but think about immersive and the history of immersive experiences and the the different ways that that has been deployed um, for a variety of different practices. Uh, we think now about immersive in terms of these sort of like highly mediated, big screen surround sound type situations. Um, but... I mean, speaking of the end of the 19th century, you know, all of the, um, you know, the attempts to reach the other side were also immersive experiences that depended on a whole type of entryway. And there was a guide there and there was light and there was sound like, you know, and there's, you know, there's books on this. And so, I mean, I, I definitely think in terms of, there's a sort of way of thinking about it in terms of immersive art. Um, I mean, personally, what wound up really kind of exciting me about it was uh, thinking about this issue of the eye and the eye contact and the neuropsychology side of it, in part because the way it's produced with these soft materials and so forth is so much in contrast to the way we typically think of a topic like um, optic, optic art, neuropsychology, like those things I typically think of as having this sort of like very cool, aloof, very distant, uh, controlled type of aesthetics. And this is not at first glance that. And so I I, I personally just always appreciate when, uh, let's say the medium and the message have a kind of point of tension around them as it were. Uh, so that, that was really something that I've been trying to think through, especially because it is really uncomfortable um, to sustain eye contact and, and to be still in the way that these machines particularly ask us to do that. And I wondered at the time um, whether that had partly to do with every, all the life changes that have happened over the course of the 20th century. We don't, um, maybe it's because we live in New York, but like living in New York, I don't often find myself sort of lying on the, my back, looking up at the sky or looking up at something and trying to just think about it, you know, and thinking about myself looking at it. Uh, maybe there's people out there who lie down on the grass. I don't like the way the way grass feels on my skin, so I'm not going to do that. But um, I think that that's a challenging experience for us, perhaps in a way that it wasn't uh, some time ago. And then there's just the materiality of it. I think actually I'm interested in the craft. Um, I'm interested in the way these are made um, in these in this really complicated, intricate manner, um, using materials, as Ethan said, from craft shops that are not associated with uh, this type of high level of production um, to produce something that is that initially seems like it was thrown together. Right. If you're just walking by it quickly and all you get is a few visual snaps, um, it, it doesn't look as carefully produced as it is. And then suddenly to realize how intricate um, yeah, I, and I, I could go on, but I'll stop. <laughs> Ethan, I was I was oh sorry, Saul, what were you gonna say? No, nothing. Either I was <laughs> I noticed that. It was brought up by either in Saul's essay or, or Elizabeth Ferrer's essay, this idea that you would cannibalize one machine in order to make the next one. And this kind of feeds back also into what Charlotte said sort of at our meeting two two days ago about this idea of sloppy craft. Um, the, the machines do have this incredible organic quality, um, which does have that, you know, am I really going to get into this thing? What is it going to produce? And then... To speak from experience, the, the experience you have inside is actually very smooth and streamlined. And there is no, you know, duct tape in your periphery. There is no sense that the the lights are, you know, are, are sort of stuck together. It's very, very smooth and very, um, very effective. So, you know, I first of all, 
I, you know, I love this idea of the cannibalization of previous to make the next, but also, you know, what was your process in creating, you know, would you just kind of work on it and have someone lying there and saying, what do you see? Is this high enough? How does this work? And, and then, you know, as a coder to that, was there an end in sight? Did you kind of see the perfect machine on the horizon or was it just kind of a myth that you, you, you two or the team used to keep moving forward? Yeah, thanks. Good question. There's a lot in there. So Bobby was completely focused on the experience of the viewer and doing whatever he had to do to improve that experience. So maybe a third of the time of his entire studio practice was putting himself in the shoes in the head of the viewer and seeing what he saw and what he experienced and just massaging the little details and um, it's astute of you to put your finger on that transition that happens as the viewer enters the piece becomes comfortable the music turns on the viewer's head is positioned there's this transformation that happens from this prototype object in a gallery setting or as we saw in some of the slides when we brought it to walmart or the metropolitan museum there's a, a threshold that the viewer crosses at some point into this divine, serene space. And I think that a good analogy for that would be when you attend an impressionist painting show. Mm. And what I find, if you look at the viewers at an impressionist show, they find a place where the distance between them and the painting is such that they can lean in and see brushstrokes and lean out and see the Riviera. And then they lean in and they lean out. And that transition between the pictorial world and the gallery space of brushstrokes and stretch canvas and viewership, that transition is, is the magic that they're so attracted to. So I think there's a lot of that going on too, that And if I can jump magic, in. Sure, please, yes. I mean, I just wanted to say, you know, um, I, when I experienced it, I had not expected it to be as smooth as it was. Um, and it was incredibly calming, which I also hadn't expected. Um, I don't think typically of like lights and bright, in this way as being something calming and yet it was and you had mentioned earlier care and i think that that's one of the things that's quite remarkable about it is the fact that um one is positioned one is situated the fact that there's someone there also creates a situation in which as the person experiencing it um you can release into this experience of care right and i think that that's um you know, I, I don't want to speak it for everyone, but just like, I think, you know, in New York, we're constantly having to be aware of our environments. There's this constant tension of wherever you are needing to pay attention to things just on the edges. And, you know, so the sense of like, you're doing whatever you're doing. And at the same time, constantly having to be aware of what's going on over here and, and potentially protect for it. And I mean that in the most casual sense, like we walk down streets, weaving in and out of each other because we're doing that. Right. But it's part of the reason why people talk about New York as being really exhausting. Um, it has to do with this sort of secondary level of, um, of attention that we're giving and in and in one of these machines you get to release that and i hadn't thought about it but it's in part also because that there's the there's the guide there there's this sense of the fact that the person is paying attention on your behalf um in a way that is weirdly just to go back to immersive experiences absolutely not there if you are in a vr headset Right. No matter the fact that someone might have put it on your head, there isn't that same sense because the guide is now um, you, you're you're totally alone in a way in which with these machine with these machines, but these environments, really, you're just simply not. Um, I think that that's a really important part of it. And if I may, I also just want to pick up on this thing around craft. I had mentioned um, this notion and, it, and it's a complicated term. Uh, 
that was raised uh, uh, some time ago around this notion of sloppy craft. And it's a term that people really don't like and understandably so, because sloppy seems to be dismissive. But I think um, it's a term that's meant to sort of put side by side sloppy and craft. And when it was um, raised uh, regarding Josh Frott's work uh, by um, a professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, she it was not meant to be derogatory. It was meant very specifically to address the way in which like there was this high level of technical skill that was there, but wasn't the point of the object. And that that was part of what she was trying to distinguish around the practice of some of the um, young artists that she was seeing. And that there was a concept and the concept was the goal, but the materials um, were allowed to have straggling threads and that sort of sort of element because even though everything was carefully put together and very intentionally put together um, and the technical skill and knowledge about the materials was evident in how they had been selected and presented, which is very much to the point of what you were saying about how Bobby picked the materials. Um, it was the concept that was really uh, being allowed to lead. And I and I just, I, I felt that in uh, Bobby's work, which is one of the reasons I do think it's interesting to bring up because I think the notion of craft is relevant here. I, I think also, whether consciously or unconsciously, Bobby was fitting himself into this sort of, not not to keep using sloppy craft, but this, this kind of tradition, which is mostly cinematic, because it makes me think of, um, you know, eternal sunshine of the, of the, of the what is it, eternal sunshine of spotless the, mind spotless mind or um labius wood's chair in 12 monkeys um this idea of this like contraption that provides a transcendental experience i mean even back, back to the future it's like um the mad scientist and then you enter it and then obviously it you know in in all of those movies you are it works right so i feel like this is this is part of this idea I don't know if that was that was something he was thinking about or you were thinking about when you're doing that but this kind of anti-tech because the VR machine is very you know it's very streamlined just fits on your head this is like entering into the cave or you know having the kind of mystical journey kind of thing I don't know yeah I'd love to pick up on that um he I think you guys are spot on that I would add that he wanted it to be so accessible and part of his aesthetic agenda was that he wanted to communicate that this is available to you. You do not need to spend a million dollars and have some high tech thing that was engineered in Palo Alto that with craft materials and high school wood shop know how true peace is possible and available to you, the viewer. Hmm. Um, and uh, I also want to add, just in terms of intentionality, that while it appears that everything is on display, there is hidden technology here to make the pieces very safe, really slick hardware solutions that made them pretty bomb-proof. And while the wiring is slipshod, the technology driving the LEDs is top of the market, Las Vegas, electronic dance music production quality. It, it is the, the finest technology that is available in the market. Okay, but what about, what about the other option, you know, the, the hallucination quality? What happens if, you, if you're in the machine for 45 minutes? I mean, that, you know, the, 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 the kind of mind blowing experience. I mean, I think I, I was in it for what, three and a half minutes, six minutes. I was wondering lying there, I was I was saying to myself, what if I just lay here all day? What would happen? I mean, did you did you guys lie in the machines and try that out? What was that experience like? Yeah, for sure we did. And close allies of the studio, friends and family did also. Um, William, I would invite you to come back to the studio and try that and tell us what you think. And how did people on the street respond? So when you did the 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 Walmart 
shop, the Walmart parking lot experience outside the Metropolitan Museum of Art. What did, and maybe we can queue up another video if we have one, but what were what were the sort of non art world people's responses to to the machines? Yeah, it was wonderful. It was um, sort of a, a proof of concept of Bobby's that you don't need to be an art insider to get a lot out of these machines. And also it was a wonder, wonderful challenge for Bobby and me to try to recruit passers-by um, to trust us enough to, to experience it. You know, a, a tourist in front of the Metropolitan Museum walking by, it's like, hey, welcome to New York. Why don't you lay down on my bed? My friend will watch your purse for you. It's it's preposterous. And it's um, totally so preposterous. I'm so sorry. How I, I've been wanting to ask this question, so I'm gonna like reiterate what the question. How on earth? Right? Like <laughs> I have been in some altered states of mind around the Metropolitan Museum over the years, but like <laughs> how on earth did you actually get nice people who are walking by who are on Museum Mile to think, yes, this is a good idea? Because I know you did it and you did it successfully, but like you must have planned. I mean, what did you say? What did you do? Did you dress in a particular way? Like, how did that work? Yeah, it was um, it was really fun. It was trial and error. So we each had our own icebreakers that we refined. My favorite was, hey, have you guys seen this? As if it was a thing that people are talking about and New Yorkers are doing it or whatever. And then as soon as you break the seal and get someone to stop, as soon as you get someone to break stride, then it's a matter of warmth and charisma. And um, it, it was inconsistent, of course, but uh, yeah, we got pretty good at it. I don't know. And then Walmart, um, actually, a really brief anecdote about the Walmart experience. That was different and revealed another part of Bobby's life and practice, which is making room for serendipity and letting grace come into our lives and practice. So when we set up in the Walmart parking lot in Newburgh, New York, we were yeah maybe like 500 feet from the entrance. It was in the afternoon. The pieces really work uh, once it's once twilight hits because there's no competing with sunlight um, in terms of brightness and color. So around twilight, some guy pulled up next to us in kind of a souped up Subaru with one of those ones where the turbocharger and cut off muffler. And he said, oh, you guys here for the car meet? And what happened was it just happened to be on that night on that Walmart, there was one of these Facebook group car meets for the guys who soup up their Dodge Chargers and uh, 80s Corvettes, you know, lawless cowboys who have LEDs tricked out in their wheel wells. And so we were amongst this community of cowboys and cowgirls with our souped up machines with music and LEDs who were showing up in this corner of this Walmart parking lot on this night just to show our machines to each other. So we had kind of a captive audience, incredibly receptive audience. And we had a line all night as if we were at the Spring Bake Art Fair. It was unbelievable. We didn't know it was happening. We didn't plan for it. Uh, we made room for serendipity and grace landed in our laps. And that kind of thing happened to Bobby all the time. I wanted to talk a little bit about biography and I, I guess open up this up to Saul and Ethan and also to David Goodman, who I know is in the audience. Um, Bobby studied at RISD. Uh, what sort of how did all of this begin to swirl around i know that there were some drawings at least and a prototype mach machine in art in graduate school so what was you know what was the art or you know the sort of vasari what was the background on this artist you know how did how did this start you know do we have any um anecdotes Saul do you want to just start the ball rolling talk a bit about his history once again given given my connection to this work and and what I do what I do I I literally my relationship to this is that I uh organize the estate uh so basically uh I didn't I haven't I haven't really other than writing the catalog essay I haven't really concerned myself with the artist or uh, or with uh, his biography and things like that. Uh, 
And my, my main connection to, to Bobby is through the machines and the idea that these, these are worth preserving and uh, that they work on, on a multiple different levels and that uh, my job was to create a platform for that. So once again, I'd have to leave this to Ethan to talk about Bobby because uh, Bobby's an unknown quantity to me. Mm -hmm. So Ethan, where did, where did you meet Bobby and, and what state in his artistic development was he at when you met him? Um, yeah, so I had just moved to Brooklyn in a big house um, with six roommates, a big townhouse in Crown Heights, and we hosted lots of parties and potlucks. I met Bobby on the second night that I moved to that house. He was a dear friend of one of the roommates, and he and I totally hit it off. So I had an art practice in uh, Vermont, where I was from, for the preceding decade, and was probably selling half my work to New Yorkers anyway. So I decided to move down there. And uh, Bobby had just moved to New York from Providence after finishing his MFA at RISD. And he had been there probably like six months or something like that, was just getting his studio practice launched and had a really cool opportunity to participate in the Spring Break Art Fair. He was um, totally behind on his project. He had a concept that looked like one of these drawings that we're seeing now like okay this is what i want to make and i have 40 days to do it and actually install it in midtown manhattan um how are we going to connect the dots so because of my experience in my own art practice with installation um, institutional commissions that sort of logistics planning scheduling um material list cut list just getting the thing done uh is one of my core competencies and so we hit it off and by the end of that first night at the party at my house um we had agreed that i would help him with this project for hire and um i started the next day we totally hit it off we worked together for probably 35 out of the next 40 days and uh that first piece was a total success we found that we were a really good fit for each other in terms of the work environment, personally, uh, aesthetics, sense of humor, energy and adventure. Uh, and five years later, um, here we are. Yeah. And David Goodman, uh, I wanted to ask because you have been sort of set the task of looking through an artist's effects and creating differentiating between the idea of stuff that is not needed and archive, which is. Um, can you comment on that? Can we find David in the audience? And David, you should be able to unmute if you want. Are we well he's um maybe figuring that out if he can't i wonder if i could just ask a, a passing question yeah um just because uh saul you had mentioned you know working on the estate and, and more and more aware of some of the technological um bits and the logistics of what these machines are what is the plan for uh preservation and conservation um, uh Right now, there isn't any. Right now, the estate has is, not been settled. Uh, what form the estate will take, either as a foundation, a trust, or a or a continuation. Uh, the next step, actually, is to generate a series of technical drawings so that uh, and uh, there are certain characteristics of these machines that are possibly patentable. So there's a patent model that's being constructed and a patent lawyer working on that. Because uh, I was going to ask, I mean, as you, as um, Ethan, as you guys were working on these, were you keeping track of all of the different um, source materials? 
that's that's actually the, the, the next the next phase is actually for Ethan and and whoever will do those technical drawings to sit down and go through that go through that in terms of what are the materials, what are the sources, what's the technology, so on and so forth. How are these things constructed? And down to and including the sort of do it yourself aspects of it so uh because as ethan said uh one of the considerations is that these are possibly prototypes therefore they're not works of art they're in the in the sense that they're not singular works of art and that they're really models for uh the possibility of producing other of uh replicating them and so on and so forth uh, as a uh, distribution model uh the uh, these are things that I don't decide that the, lawyer, the lawyers and the uh, and the uh, family will decide in terms of do we keep the studio open and people can order order their their own uh, things yeah. like that. Uh, our original concern was to validate a certain degree of validation that these were meaningful and that people would actually respond to them and that Bobby wasn't some crazy kook uh, who was off on, off on his own trip and that this was eventually headed for the dumpster. Uh, and just because there were the historical allusions that Ethan made earlier regarding um, like with the jacket loomed uh, tent that was referencing this uh, peace negotiation between the English and French. Um, I mean, that's a very, very specific example. Do each of the machines have a very sort of a kind of historical point or a um a reading reference or something that is like part of what the idea and the shape and the construct of them is about there there are two well i haven't gone through bobby's notebooks but it, it, basically in the it, there's a digital archive of everything that was on his laptops on his iphone so on and so forth and there's not a significant amount of that type of information he didn't seem much if he knew about those things and, and those were the things that were inspiring him, he didn't necessarily record them. And once again, uh, it's uh, one of the other things that's on my on the to do list is that uh, in terms of my contract is for someone to sit down with Ethan and do an oral history. Because Ethan is Ethan is sort of the living hard drive that records that that uh and has that type of intimate information because i can't help but even just think you know here with the tigers um which had been brought up earlier and i realized that there's this personal biographical association with it um but given his interest in buddhism um if the tigers aren't also sort of pointing in that direction given uh the important their importance as a symbolic animal in tibetan buddhist yeah. So once again, there's no there's no evidence, or in terms of the cursory. And I wish David would come on because David's actually touched every single thing that was left behind. Uh, that other than a, a, a one or a cup a book on Buddhist on on Buddhist meditation that I think was. Uh, marked up but not necessarily annotated uh there there aren't these types of this type of information raising a really interesting question i'm just going to go off here on a slight tangent for a second because i mean we're talking also about these records and the references in terms of notes and um you know what's in what is information on the computer which are all sort of um long-standing references, but it suddenly occurs to me that for a contemporary artist, what they follow on Instagram or any particular sort of, uh, I mean, just as one example, could also be a really, could be a, a relevant uh, reference in terms of their areas of interest and so forth. Um, I don't know if Bobby would even like, 
how, how much did Instagram or whatnot, but it just. Uh, it's, it's from what we have as, you know, taken from the, from uh, his iPhones, his iPhones and from his laptop. Uh, didn't, uh, there's no significant record of, of his engagement with Instagram other than him, what he posted to it and, and his, his a, a Vimeo account in which I think there's a, a couple, there's a couple of uh, videos, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, that is funny because in practice, he spent so much time on Instagram and then in the last year on TikTok. And he thought that social media was actually the way to to reach a broader audience that after working in the contemporary art world for a couple of years in New York, um, he thought it was uh, limited and insular. But I mean, this is I mean, I realize we're sort of off, but like this is just sort of an interesting moment in the sense of like to what degree for future records would it be um useful as it turns out to potentially uh request uh the data on someone uh with companies like meta right in the sense of being yeah. like we would like the records of the time spent uh the likes the you know what is your like this is where the alg like the black boxing and the algorithmic stuff gets beyond sort of the issues of surveillance culture and actually becomes right. an interest for the historical record no well mm -hmm. that's this was one of the reasons why you know uh it not normally in most in most cases the arc an artist archive is considered basically the papers left behind here we had to literally retrieve and in a lot of, and in in the in the case of some of this uh there were no passwords things had to be hacked uh uh there are things that were still locked out of uh IT people had to be brought in uh, and I had to find somebody who literally does digital archiving and went through thousands and thousands of files. And this is a, a good setup for a final thought question I wanna to pose to everyone talking right now, um, which is this idea of the, the abyss between the crit criticality and the thing being criticized, right? So. Obviously, this idea of the spectacular world in which we live, which co-ops things like hallucinogenic experiences and and drug experiences and and then makes it mainstream and make uses it for sort of uh, commercial purposes. I just wanted to read from, you know, Debord. Uh, the spectacle presents itself simultaneously as an as all of society, as part of society and as an instrument of unification, as a part of society is specifically the sector which concentrates all gazing and all consciousness due to the very fact that this sector is separate. It is the common ground of the deceived gaze and of false consciousness, and the unification it achieves is nothing but an official language of generalized separation. Um, I think Elizabeth Ferrer brings this up and she falls on the side of saying, that she feels that Bobby Ansbach's work was altruistic in that it was trying to pull us away from the sort of tentacles of the spectacle. Um, but is it? I think this is a very interesting these immersive experiences, uh, experiences in which we lose sense of body are being co-opted. What where does the where does the artist, A, the concept of the artist, but where does Bobby Ansbach fit in this idea? I, um, I yeah, I think I think you know one of the things that hasn't come up is this notion of interiority and exteriority. That the external aspect of Bobby's work is spectacle, and in which he try he uses it as a as a, a lure to pull people in, and then ultimately the idea is that it's a switch and, a switch and bait sort of tactic in which I I promise you this spectacle. And what you're going to end up is with this transcendental, transcendent, possibly transcendental moment. I mean, I would also just want to say, you know, I think uh, we'd want to be careful to think that the I is not an embodied experience. Um, the I, first of all, just simply is a part of our physical bodies. Um, and these types of experiences 
uh, seem really ocular, but one of the after effects of them is often walking around very much aware of one's experience okay. being in the world. And so, um, and and I would argue that, you know, what the board was concerned about regarding spectacle was the way in which that there was not then that after effect, that all it did was produce like a continuous right. desire for more um, desensitized, uh, flashy, um, experiences. And I think that that's very much the opposite of what's being done here. And I think it's one of the complicated ways in which the word spectacle winds up getting used um, because it's not all things that are bright and big and potentially flashy um, are spectacle in that particular way. Um, there are, you know, I digress. I mean, I think, I think, it, but I would also just say, you know, regarding the interiority and the exteriority, I think one of the nice things about um, the sort of in out thing that I was trying to say, not articulating very clearly at the beginning is just simply the way in which the push pull really does allow us to one, make choice, right? You, because of the push pull of the, of the reaction one has upon noticing these um I'm gonna just call them objects for a moment. One has to decide, one makes a choice. I am going to do this. I am not going to do this. And if one makes a choice to do it, one has suddenly actually become an intentional actor in one's own life in a way that is often not as a parent. And then there's this funny experience of you, you know, are in this machine and you're taken care of and it it, it is a hard to describe experience. And then on the other side of it, you're very much in the world. And I think that that's actually, I mean, at least from, you know, the readings of uh, what, what people experience, you know, whether it's in the Walmart parking lot or on the, you know, Fifth Avenue, even in those unexpected contacts, people were having that reaction, which speaks to the way in which interiority and exteriority can actually um, not become binaries, but become operations that are working alongside each other to produce a more cohesive or a more complete experience. And I think that that's, I mean, just to go back to the notion of the Gesamtkunst work, right, is this notion of the total body of work that is very, very difficult to achieve. I mean, we've all experienced so many terrible versions of attempts at that, right? Um, and yet here actually startlingly works. Cool. Shall we open up to questions? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so, so, so much, everyone, for that really inspiring and beautiful conversation in honor of Bobby. Um, it's been such an honor to have you all speak. Um, we do have some questions from the audience. And if anyone else would like to ask a question, please do raise your hand or send a message in the chat. Um, but our first question today will be from Ty. Hey, y'all. Uh, thanks, Will. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, thanks, Saul and Ethan. Um, really great conversation today. I have my question is sort of small in the scheme of things, but um, Ethan, you mentioned Vermont. I'm from Vermont, too. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the like how you feel about the kind of art world there versus here and maybe the ways that like Bobby played into your relationship to to the city art world as you came into it and um I also feel like the I mean correct me if you disagree I feel like sometimes the work up there can lean towards something sort of like colorful and sculptural kind of like this work so I was wondering if you could talk about that yeah so Bobby grew up in Ohio and spent some time in California, then Boston before landing in New York. So like Vermont in some ways, I think um, artists who aren't from New York hold a certain uh, mystique and exoticism uh, to the New York art, contemporary art scene. You know, it's kind of legendary, especially for conceptual art. And Bobby really, aspired to become part of that. And I think the, when he showed up and started 
going through sort of more conventional means of doing that, doing the art fairs and had some success, but nothing meteoric. I think that's when he pivoted to the gorilla pop-ups as sort of an outsider's way in and through um, the social media stuff. So sort of an indirect way of answering your question. Um, you know, my own practice is really quite different from Bobby's. Um, we were a good fit for each other in his studio practice, but I, I think uh, his coming from the Midwest to New York definitely had an influence on what he, how he wanted to be seen by others. And um, his sort of attempt at conquering his own demons of uh, vanity and affirmation, um, it was all in his artwork. The, his art was for him to control himself and to offer tools to the viewer for them to transcend themselves too. And it was, it was really mission driven. And I, I see his trajectory from um, Ohio finally to New York as part of that. Ethan, real fast. Uh, my understanding was the pivot, the pivot to the more gorilla things actually coincided with uh, COVID when art bears and so on were shut down. How much, how much of that if, uh, affected Bobby's thinking, meaning COVID? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, his final fair was actually in March when, you know, even at the Spring Break Art Fair, people were already handshaking with elbows. Right, that's um, the one that Charlotte wrote about. Yep, right on. So, um, yeah, it definitely coincided in time. And But I, I think the time had come anyway. You know, he had been working for three years in New York. And I, I, I know that he was surprised and disappointed that his early, early successes um, in terms of uh, press, public response at the fairs, didn't uh, garner more traction and opportunities. So sort of a case in point is um, when he worked with uh, Elizabeth Fair at Brick, Brick took out a full page ad in Art Forum. The entire page was only an image of Bobby's work and it was a beautiful image. And, you know, for Bobby, that that was really kind of a high watermark in terms of um, affirmation and recognition in sort of the insider's art uh, periodical. And he got exactly zero emails, letters, calls, or inquiries based on that full page article. And I think that was that experience and others like it were disillusioning for him. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Ty. Um, our next question I will be asking on behalf of Tom McGlynn. Tom, is curious if Bobby was aware of the scope of Paul Feck's similarly visionary art and installations. It didn't come up in conversation in the studio. Cool. Um, and I have a question as well about um, kind of inspirations along the lines of what Will mentioned about some cinematic connections to Bobby's art um the work and then also just the the wide range of um evocations I think that can be drawn from this work from impressionism which really resonated with me to cinema um I'm wondering what other mediums or um artists were of source of inspiration to Bobby or um to anybody's practice who worked with Bobby how it influenced his creations. Sal, you want to start? It, the, once again, in the in the archive, there's, there's I haven't I haven't gone through the complete archive, but in terms of the materials that I have, 
researched and so on, none of this comes up. Uh, the, men the mention of other artists that doesn't really come up. I mean, in my essay, I actually connected to independent filmmakers from the 60s, like Stan Vanderbeek's uh, uh, Domes and uh, other, other, other filmmaker artists who did uh, uh, film installations who were trying to get away from the, 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 you know, from the screen and things like that and, and make film environmental. So I, I'm, I, th those, those are associations that I have to it, and, uh, you know, uh, once again in my my essay, I, I, uh, I because they're they're my associations, and I couldn't find any affirmation of it. I, I kept it very limited. Yeah, I mean, I guess that if anybody else has connections that they've drawn, I would be curious to hear about that too. So thank you, Saul. I don't know. If uh, he, yeah, he loved uh, Yayoi Kusama and Paul Chen. Mm -hmm. And he had a library full of Buddhist literature and a whole collection of Dr. Seuss books. That makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you so much for those answers. Um, and if anyone else wants to jump in, definitely feel free. But if not, we have our final question today from Fong. Thank you, Fong. Pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Saul and Will. Talking about Bobby's work. I'm sure you all remember this very book because I've been thinking how much we I miss Ken Johnson writing for the New York Times. So this book right here, published in 2011, and the frontal piece. Can you guys read it? Joe Brenner. If Nancy is an ASIC freak. So this book was very meaningful uh, for me because I curated a show in 2014, I think, it, at Red Bull Studio. And it was called Space Out Migration to the Interior. Uh, it was a fun show, which I felt it was I, I thought of it was a collected, playful exploration of uh, psychedelic consciousness in what I have experienced in contemporary art, really. You know, and the show, I believe, feature artists between, born between, in the 20s, really, up to the 80s. And whoever had the same interest, sharing, you know, psychedelic experience, this order time perception, consensus trends, induction, turn on, tune in, drop out, you know, temporal illusion, all the things that we 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 know of as you remember the doors of perception, that great autobiography by Addis Huxley, uh published I think in early 50s or mid 50s, can't remember the exact date, but it was the very book that inspired Jim Morrison to name his band The Door. Yes. Very interesting. Since you all have spoken of Bobby's work in reference to Impressionism, to psychedelia, um, I felt there's an aspect of Baroque sensibility, which, as you know, is very close to Buddhism. There's, there's Baroque Sintoism, there's Baroque Buddhism, there's that a very, very specific sense that overwhelms the spiritual aura when you are in a certain context in the temple, you know? So it's interesting to hear that he was interested in Buddhism there, Ethan, you know? Uh, but my question is very simple. Um, I wonder whether we can also put Bobby's work in context of, say, Jason Rose, for example, you know, who is known for his Installation comprised of electric construction and neo signage and 
among other objects to explicitly address sexuality, consuming culture. You know, in fact, you have written a very wonderful essay about his work so for one magazine I remember written years ago where you essentially say that you know Jason Rose installation can be likened of a yourself organized according to principle association of stream of consciousness is scada art you know so I wonder Ethan whether he had brought up the reference to Rose's work. If not, we can discuss it because I think it's important to put in context, not to reduce his creative energy. Uh, I don't mean to, to say that, but put in context, you know, uh, because obviously he's very thoughtful, he's very scientific and have a different aim altogether, pictorially speaking. Um, so can we all have sort of a few sentences or thoughts on that relationship. Let's start with Saul, since he wrote that article. <laughs> there, I mean, once once again, uh, the, the machines themselves, I don't necessarily fit into that Rhodes thing. Bobby's earlier work, things that he, installations that he had done at RISD and so on and so forth, very much are that sort of uh, flea market of the unconscious. Uh, no, uh, they consist of notations, drawings. Uh, have, they have sort of uh, the types of uh, triangular banners that are used at the opening of supermarkets and things like that. And very much is that a series of, or at least seemingly from the documentation, series of free associations. Uh, once again, in, in, because I, the doc, uh, I don't have access to documentary, you know, in terms of uh, the machines and so on, there's, for me, there's a lot of associations to psychedelic art, to this notion of high-low, in which, yeah. as I said, there's this, you know, the pom-pom, you know, the, the idea of the pom-poms and then this high technology, so on and so forth, very much like Rhodes uh, played with in, in, in his early work. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, would see, I, I would see that. Once again, you know, it's not like Bobby was an untrained artist. He uh, went to art school two years at RISD. Two years at RISD is enough to give you the ambition to want to come to New York and be famous in 24 hours. So, uh, but he started these machines in, when he was at RISD. And, uh, you know, the, the 14 or 15 machines that we have are seven year, uh, the product of seven years of working. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But there are there are other there are uh, other there are other bits and pieces. Uh, none of the earlier installations were actually the elements of them were preserved, but none of them were actually are were kept together. Let's say uh, David Goodman knows knows uh, about the fragmentation frag, fragments. But also that early work where the, where the machines bring everything together in one place as mm. a portable sort of environment, uh, the earlier works were much more architecturally dependent and fractured and fragmented. Yeah. Uh, Will, any comment on that? I think it's intriguing uh, that <laughs> we are talking so much about the aesthetics of the machines, um, and that's where they have a sort of kinship with Jason Rhodes. But I think Bobby Anspach is much more, I mean, he is about one kind of singular idea and pursuing this idea of this, like, you know, in turning in of the, of the consciousness. And I, it is, it is, I think it's really important that we discuss the aesthetics of the machines, because I think that like that often goes on, on, unacknowledged or un, un sort of calibrated. And, you know, we were talking, you know, Charlotte was mentioning before, it's really important, you know, almost that every artist deserves a kind of syllabary or a, or a glossary of their references because 
it, it is, you know, that's what makes it distinctive. And you can go through the artist and say, oh, the tiger, the use of the tiger, <laughs> whether they knew why they used the tiger, whether it had to do with, you know, the, a, a nickname that their mother had for them, besides the fact that it also features in Buddhism. I mean, you know, these things can be soaked up over time. So I feel like there is the necessity to, as an artist, look at his work from the details but I do think it's funny that in the end, these all seem to be subservient to this idea of this like transcendental experience. And, you know, whether in the end that's really the truth of the matter or not, you know, is is irrelevant. Because talking about the movies, I mean, the great thing about all those movies, you know, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and 12 is like it does it's it's make believe. Right. You can't have that transcendental experience. It's invented and the machine brings oh. you there. Bobby Anspach's goal was to make the machine accomplish this sort of magical feat. Um, so I think there is the difference there is that he's got one idea. Rhodes is is creating a sort of uh, ecosystem and environment of of references and and sort of this. Um, oh God, what's his name? Uh, the you know the machines from the nineteen the the cartoon machines from the nineteen thirties uh, that you know do nothing but but accomplish one task. Um, so I, I think that that's the difference. I mean, there's a similarity aesthetically, and that can that can be assessed. But I think Onspock yeah. is much more focused. So yeah. we we didn't write it down, but Bobby and I actually went and saw Jason Rhodes together. I just looked mm -hmm. up when it was 2019 at David's just, Werner Gallery. That's right. That's right. And that's, um, we make a note. I know for a fact. Say it mm -hmm. again. Let's yeah. So I know for a fact yeah. that. He was inspired by especially the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. how, I mean, it, it is sloppy. All the lines connecting everything. So it brings the eye all around, having all the wiring exposed, having the whole thing look like it was slapped together because there were only six hours to install the whole thing. Um, and then also he, we didn't go together. We went separately, but he was really inspired by Nick Cave at mm -hmm. Mass Mocha and mm -hmm. uh memory and aggregation yeah um let me ask you because you are the close friend ethan so essentially he he went to RISD and he dropped out after two years right no, no he, he finished. Just, he finishes his mfa mfa oh, well that's very uh amazing the reason why i, I brought up um jason rose partly because his mentor was paul mccarthy and you know, however much it works different, but the anarchy of spirit is very similar. So, was there any mentor that any artist that he spoke to you early on, Ethan, that he admire? He did not have an artist mentor in that way. He had artists who is who inspired him, like Paul McCarthy, who actually I think is study of Paul McCarthy opened him up to Paul Chan, who I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And, uh, but he didn't, he didn't have a, a mentor master artist um, yeah, per I se, did. but he did have in New York um, a small handful of very close friends who were more established and whom he consulted with on a per project basis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to learn more. So thank you so much. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry that full page ad in Art Forum did not bring any kind of <laughs> writing <laughs> acknowledgement. Oh, uh, do you have anything you want to <laughs> um, By the way, we have a great artist who have worked with lights and installation forever, James Clark, yeah. in, in, in our screen here. Can we ask Jim for a comment on anything, Jim? Have you known of Bobby's work and you've been tuning into this whole entire time? Is there any observation you can share with us? Can we give Jim the mic? Maybe Eleanor and I give back to you now. Well, I think the work uh, really photographs amazingly. And those images really invite the viewer into the work. Uh, I find the work has this edge that's kind of, that's not being talked about is the whole clinical and 
the hospital thing of like going into the MRI or something like that it has this idea that I feel about the work, you know, and the idea that you have to be with the work to feel the work is very important to the work. And I can go on, but I don't want to. <laughs> wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Fong, for that wonderful note to end on. And thank you, James, for your contributions. And a huge thanks again to Saul and Ethan and Charlotte and Will for this wonderful, wonderful conversation. Uh, we do have a tradition here at the rail of concluding our events with a poetry reading. And today I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, George Fragopoulos to the stage. George Fragopoulos is a poet, translator and publisher living and working in Brooklyn. He is the author of Heretical Materialism, a Pasolini triptych and the chapbooks 14 poems in 516 lines in days of April to May, 2022. He is an associate professor of English at Queensborough Community College and an associate professor of liberal studies at the CUNY Graduate Center. George, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you all for having me. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, thank you for everybody at the Brooklyn Rail for hosting. Uh, thank you to Will, Charlotte, um, Ethan, and Saul for their incredible and illuminating words. Um, I've actually already made an appointment to go to the exhibit in Gowanus next weekend, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Uh, in deciding what I wanted to read for today, I just wanted to kind of read some poems that I felt in some sort of way spoke to Bobby's uh, work. Um, and in particular, I was really struck by his essay slash manifesto, uh, an apparently messianic artist statement. And that's a very, very short version of a very, very long title. Um, so I was really kind of just struck by, yeah, the, just that artist statement and what Bobby was trying to get to through his words there. Um, so I just wanted to read some poems that I felt replicated that. I also just wanted to quickly say that I really love what Will said about these machines being kind of false hallucinogenic experiences because I think that's also a really great way to describe uh, poems, or at least what I hope these poems are doing to some degree. Uh, so this poem is titled uh, May 27th, 2022. I steal these lines back from the censors as I'm watching you walk up the narrow streets toward the wolf's peak as if carried by the winds in El Greco's The Vision of St. John, days haloed by an ochre glow even the pigeons seem like misplaced phenomena from some forgotten heaven. In the streets, riot police. The poem tells us that was the August they stabbed the migrant in the train station. Remember that milk is better than water for flooding tear gas out of the eyes, as if the shimmering icons of the Galoctotrofusa have come to life and are fulfilling their aesthetic potential. The visual revolution of tempera and gold on wood paneling aligning with the utopian future in front of parliament, in the shadow of the national cenotaph, the same rituals over and over again, only meters away from when the pensioner committed suicide. This is the first time I've seen this drama unfold amidst the bitter orange trees as piles of tawny globes litter the streets. Trees make the best communists, we thought to ourselves, until my aunt explained to us that the fruit was too sour to eat, otherwise the hungry citizenry would have picked them apart. And I still feel guilty for leaving you behind, if only for a few seconds, on that concrete island, asking you to risk a chance encounter with the avenue's traffic, as I sped across in the wake of some unknown compatriots, imagining that one of them was a version of me that had never left this nation, never exchanged one country for another, never stopped living within the echoes of the mother tongue until all this dreaming became real when passing through customs to return to a decaying empire. I was asked which passport I had used, was asked by border control how I had managed to sneak into this country. And I thought, am I not the pilgrim I have always been? Um, I will read one more. It's a little bit longer than that one. Um, I also just wanted to also quickly say that these poems are from uh, my just recently published chat book, uh, which Eleanor mentioned, it's called Days of April to May, 2022. Um, it's actually so recently published that I don't even have author copies yet. So I'm just reading from a, a PDF printout of the the book itself, but this is called Relation, a sequence. Listen to what is written, the clouds lament. 
On Patmos, I held a book that speaks to me in a voice like the sun saying, write down the secret meaning of the stars, of the lamps, of the angels. These are the words, the two-edged sword, the faithful witness of what comes out of my mouth. Hidden manna, a white stone, a new name, lures to throw to the deep secrets of the star dawn spirit. These are the stars that must die. A thief will walk in white, one who opens the door to rob you of your new name. These are the words, blind and naked, refined in fire to eat together. A door stood open and the voice was a rainbow, an emerald, robed in flashes of lightning and peals of thunder and four living creatures unceasingly sing, prostrate, cry. I saw the right hand, I saw the mighty angel, I saw the seven spirits of the harp singing a new song and the sea crying. I watched the red rider holding in his hand a day's wage and the moon and stars like figs blown off a tree. I saw four winds sing from the sea. I saw a vast throng of angels crying on the sun, heat scorching heat and the springs of water of life, silence. I saw a golden fire on the earth, peals of thunder, lightning flashes, an earthquake, there came hail. The earth was burnt. A great star turned the waters bitter. The sun was struck. Light failed. I saw the key of smoke, the damage to the grass, faces of the abyss. I heard a voice, the great rivers of fire, red turquoise and sulfur yellow. I saw, wrapped in a cloud, a right foot on the sea. I heard a voice, as sweet as honey, but when I swallowed it, my stomach turned sour. I was given two olive trees, two lamps, and two prophets. The breath of life rose in the cloud and voices were heard. Now is the time to destroy those who destroy the earth. There appeared a second sign. Red stars fled into the wilderness. War broke out. I heard a loud voice proclaim, time is short, a flood spewed from the seashore. I saw a mortal wound healed, names written in the book of the Lamb. I saw great miracles and no one was allowed to buy or sell. I heard harpists singing a new song. No one could learn except the ransom. I heard a voice say, write this as a cloud like a sharp sickle swept over the earth, like the great wine press of God's wrath. Then I saw a fire holding harps singing the song of the seven plagues. The first poured out his malignant image. The second poured out the sea like blood. The third poured out the holy one. The fourth poured out the sun, the fifth poured out tongues in agony, the sixth poured out the seventh, and there followed nothing like it in human history. I saw another heaven, a dwelling for another voice. The earth will weep and wail. Cargoes of gold, silver, scarlet cloth, silks, fragrant wood, bronze, marble, all are lost. Wealth is laid to waste. Harpists and trumpeters heard no more. I saw the key to the first resurrection let loose from prison, the hosts of fire and sulfur. I saw the books of life and the dead. I heard shouting a voice like a vast throng cried, write this prophecy of iron, of an angel standing in the sun to eat the flesh of kings. I heard a God who said the lake burns with sulfurous flames. I saw no sun or moon for anyone whose names are inscribed in the book of life. On the other side of the river stood a tree of light. I saw these things in this book, the offspring of the bright star of dawn, this book of testimony. I'm coming soon. Thank you. Wow, that was so, so beautiful, George. Thank you so much for those words. Um, and thank you so much again to Saul and Ethan and Will and Charlotte for the incredible conversation. Please do make an appointment to see the exhibition. Um, the link was posted in the chat. And we'd also like to thank Sarah from Griffin PR and David for helping us prepare for today. And thank you to the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible, as well as for supporting our archive, which now has over 900 videos. And you can check it out on our YouTube channel. This conversation will be there shortly. For the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for arts, culture, and politics through a monthly publication and public events like our daily MSC. Check the chat for a link to donate to support all the work we do here at the Rail. 
and join us on Monday at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Tony Cox and Zoe Hopkins on the event of Tony's solo exhibition at Dia Bridgehampton. We will be concluding with a reading by Sasha Banks. And you can now all turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so, so much for joining us today and tuning in. Hope you all have amazing weekends and stay dry, stay safe out there. Don't get on the subway. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you, Thank you, Will. Thank you, Saul. Thank you, Fun. Thank you, Ethan. Everybody, stay You're welcome. Yeah, have a great weekend. Thank you. 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 Thank